This is the Crowd Crux Crowdfunding Podcast with With Sal Sal Brigman, Brigman. where we cover everything you need to know to To launch launch a successful successful crowdfunding campaign. campaign. We speak with proven entrepreneurs who've raised money from the crowd and want to teach you how to do the same. Stay tuned because we're about to reveal how to launch your dream project with your host, Sal Brigman. Before we get started with this podcast episode, I want to take a second to introduce you to my friends at FulfillRight. If you need help shipping out your Kickstarter or Indiegogo perks or rewards, FulfillRight is the absolute best company for you. I've been working with them for a while and I can vouch for their services. They make it dead simple and take all of the headache out of shipping out all of those boxes, all of those orders to your backers and your customers. If you want to check them out, go to fulfillright.com at F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E dot com. Hey, crowdfunders, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. My name is Salvador Brigman. Welcome. On this show, we get into how to launch a successful Kickstarter or Indiegogo campaign. We also get into niche topics like um, nonprofit crowdfunding and fundraising, equity crowdfunding, real estate crowdfunding. But my number one goal is for you to hear directly from people that are be- are there and they're doing it. They're in the trenches right now. They're raising funding and they're telling you what's working and what is not working. That is my ultimate goal with this podcast. And also, um, today, we are actually hearing from kind of a, like a special guest, I would say. Number one, um, he has launched, they have launched many successful crowdfunding campaigns. They have some advice to impart in terms of the duration of a campaign, in terms of how to get funding very quickly on Kickstarter, um, and also some other stuff when it comes to knowing what to offer and how to um, have your rewards basically easily shipped out to your backers. So some, some really great information when it comes to crowdfunding. But in addition, they have started this entirely new initiative. And this is for We The People. So We The People is kind of like, think of it this way. You enter a retail outlet, a retail store, but rather than having like random products from Target and like all over the place, they only specialize in crowdfunded products. So it's literally like a retail store for crowdfunded products. And you can sell your crowdfunded product in their store that is so interesting to me it's not like also they only have one store they have stores around the world you know they have stores in uh the united states they have stores in singapore um it's they have stores in you know malaysia you know like it's it's awesome man um i think it's it's really cool to see that people actually are able to like pick up a crowdfunded product and to to handle it and to see what it looks like and get a feel for it it kind of reminds me of brookstone honestly like some of the really nicely designed cool technology gadgets and gizmos and just some really interesting stuff travel products etc so you're going to hear from him today about number one um if you are interested how you can get your product into their store and you can start selling it around the world to customers, to real customers. Number two, you're going to learn about crowdfunding advice and tips, things that he's learned from doing his uh, different projects and campaigns. And finally, you're going to hear about a really neat event that is actually being put on in New York City. So if you're in New York City or you're you know an hour or two hours away from New York City, this is a mega event and I'm also going to be a moderator at this event. So you can meet me in person if you would like but I'm so excited to talk about it. Let's just get into it because I don't want to belabor the, the, the conversation any bit more. The only other thing I would quickly mention here is that if you have not yet, it'd be um, great if you could get onto my newsletter. My newsletter basically goes through how to start a campaign, and I share advice and tips every single week on that newsletter. So if you want to check that out, you can go to crowdcrux.com slash subscribe. That is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash subscribe, and you can get weekly tips from me. Without further ado, Let's get into today's podcast episode. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Do you think you could tell the listeners a little bit about um, what you do, what is um, you know, your company, what's your role here, etc.? Okay, so I'm Ryan. I'm behind the world's largest chain of crowdfunding retail stores. Uh, we're called We The People. So we focus on exclusively promoting products that were brought to life with crowdfunding via Indiegogo, Kickstarter, and other various crowdfunding platforms. So the whole goal here is to give these brands a physical presence because, and I I know a lot of people say like, oh, wow, why retail? You're crazy retail. But that's not true because these products are so You're crazy, man. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's right. So a a lot of times there's 
because the fact that these products are so new, the discovery only happens online. And due to the fact that a lot of products, you know, they don't work or something goes wrong, uh, budding issues, et cetera, et cetera, mm-hmm. a physical presence does help bolster that. And it does give people that trust. At mm-hmm. the end of the day, people buy things they trust. Mm-hmm. And having a physical store or stores to back that up, that is a very strong sell. It also helps promote brand equity. Um, that's what we're all about. We're all about helping um, startups, uh, small to medium businesses, get their products into into a physical location where where they couldn't before. So that's mm. what we pr- pretty much were doing. So this started in 2016. Can you tell us a little bit about like that founding story? So you kind of had this mission to get the product into people's hands and also have a physical retail presence where you can connect crowd funders um, with customers. Like how, how did that get Like where in the world did that get started? And also how did that get started? Oh, great, great question. So I back in um, I think 2015, late 2015 was when I, when I launched my first crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter. And that was my first ever attempt. Uh, I launched a, a campaign called the Haru Wallet. It was our first ever minimalist slim wallet. Mm. And we didn't do any sort of marketing, nothing like that. And we raised like, let's see, what, what, was, what was it? I think it was seven grand or five grand, something like that. Our goal was two grand. So for us to succeed on the first attempt was, was interesting because we had no idea what was going on. We had no trust and the system yet but right after that our eyes were open then we decided to launch another one and another one and another one until one point we raised uh i think the offers great success was when we hit about 100 grand in funding for uh, the archie wallet that's wow. when we realized that hey okay this that we're onto something here mm-hmm. later on um we decided hmm the problem was that now i have all these products that were funded but the issue is what happens after. Getting funded wasn't so much of an issue anymore. It was what happens after. The sustainability aspect of um, growing, you know, a bringing, yeah. grow, growing a brand. Growing a brand. Yeah, that's that's the part that was the most difficult portion. I mean, you would do the you would definitely do the online stuff, Facebook marketing, uh, listed on Amazon, stuff like that. But however, the thing is, these products are still so new. Not everyone has the build ability to touch and feel them to buy them. Mm-hmm. Word of mouth is still the best form of marketing. And, and this right? started out of Singapore, right? That's right. It started in Singapore back in 2016, September. That's when we launched our first ever pop-up store. We started as a pop-up. Okay. And did you start this with like your co-founders from your other company or did you bring other people in also? So it was started by um, me, Nisan Chan, Joel Liu, and Jay Kang. So... We're all from different backgrounds. Me and Joel, we, we were from Kisetsu. So we're the ones launching the crowdfunding campaigns. Um, Nissan, Nissan was Nissan was doing uh, Talking Toes. So he's still doing that. It's his own brand of socks, which he did not crowdfund at that point in time. Love that name. But, uh, he had Talking <laughs> Toes. Then he, we, we told him how to do it, and he ended up launching a few successful campaigns as well. And Jay. So Jay is Korean. Jay launches um oh, sorry not launches jay has a large business in korea that helps um designers mm. with physical location so he has many many places at one point in time um that gives these designers a abil- um the ability to pop up events mm-hmm. so he was bringing that concept to singapore and when he heard about this yeah he decided okay let's pivot let's let's try doing a crowdfunding store what, what kind of results have you seen so far when it comes to Singapore? Because now I know you're trying to, you're expanding, you know, into the United States, you're expanding into other territories here, but what kind of That's results right. were you seeing in Singapore? So here's some interesting stats. Um, Singapore, Singapore is, I think, the largest, ha, holds the largest amount of backers from Asia, from any, any crowdfunding campaign. If you look at crowdfunding stats on Kickstarter or anything like that, you can look at community. Look at Singapore. It's always there. Like the most number of people from from Asia is in Singapore all the why, time. Why is that? <laughs> yes. So that's interesting. We didn't realize when, when we started a long time ago. But after a while, we realized, okay, so Singapore is tier one city, right? So that and we're also, our first language is English. And we're also very heavily influenced from the Western cultures. So, <laughs> and Singaporeans are very tech savvy and forward thinking. That's why. 
that's why most of them love Kickstarter. They love the ability to help or get new things. It's it's very trendy to have that kind of things all the time mm, to okay. stay ahead of the curve. So that's why it really worked out. Um, yeah, so from a pop-up, it went to, I think at one point in time, we had almost six stores. Six stores? Jeez. Yeah, in Singapore. Yeah, that's right. Now we have four. It looked like you had a 800% growth in revenue by the end of 2017. That is crazy, man. That's wild. That's right. It was crazy. We didn't expect that mm. at all. I think it also is just that more markets are developing around the world. You know, you have more people with disposable income. They can actually spend money on things that they want, you know, not necessarily what they need. Um, and you can kind of engage in like hobbies and, you know, to be able to buy like a really expensive wallet or something that's nicely designed. Um, I think a lot now different portions around the world can do that when previously the last, you know, 20 years, maybe not as much. But um, we're seeing these pockets sort of grow around the world. And the same also with entrepreneurship. And I love the mission you guys have. It's, you know, bringing not only the digital, you know, you have digital success, like you can have a crowdfunding campaign, but bringing that into a strong retail presence, I think that's really paramount, honestly. Um, and you can also see how people interact with your, your actual product and the brand and such. Yeah, that's right. Um, we focus on growing brands. That, that's our mission. We're all about helping out and making sure that every brand with us has a fighting chance, has an opportunity to grow. Um, we operate on a success base, so it's like a consignment kind of thing. We make sure that we make sure that we, we're not selling table space because if we sell table space, if the model is that way, it'd be very difficult for the smaller creators to come on board. What What does that mean? Your work on a consignment basis. So that means. Um, we don't necessarily buy all the products all the time. It could it, it could work as a wholesale model. It could work as a consignment. But we always push for consignment. That means um, they'll send us a product, we'll, we'll sell it, and then we'll give them a portion of the sales back to them. Okay, so kind of working... So it's a success base. I see, I see. Um, how do you decide like who to work with in terms of the people that can sell in your stores? Oh, right. Okay, so that's a, that's a great question. So we always want to have a good mix of things. Uh, we don't want to laser focus on any one point. I mean, yes, we have, a, have to have good offering. So we have tech, we have home, we have travel. Um, but most importantly, our goal is to build brands. So we cannot have too many of the same segments. For example, if we have, let's say, a certain travel adapter, there cannot be more than two of the same type categories mm, in the okay. same category. Or, or else it's just cannibalizing and we're not doing each brand any justice. Um, you will also find that our layout of the store is very different from other stores or departmental stores, big stores, because we really put each product on a platform. They have their own space and it's not cluttered at all because we want to mm -hmm. give space and chance for, for them to breathe and talk to people. To be honest, I think that's also a hallmark of like more expensive stores. It's almost like when you go to like a Walmart or something that's really cheap or like a Target, all of the products are just kind of like crammed together. You know, you kind of have it's difficult to have shelf space and a standout and such. But with like a really great designer store, you go and you almost have these products like on a platform and it's almost like there's more care justified around that product. and There's more value as a result that the consumer sees, you know, you know what I mean by that? Yeah, that's exactly what we want it to be. It's like, uh, think of it as a museum for new things. Awesome, man. Um, one of the other things that kind of stood out to me about what it is you're doing, and I was kind of wanted to get some clarity on this. What's this whole live funding thing that you guys have going on? So the live funding aspect will be announced shortly. Um, right now, we're going to release some news during the event at FCBC, so you're going to have to stay tuned for that. <laughs> <laughs> you can't give us a scoop, man? Come on. No, we can't. We cannot yet. <laughs> I'm 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 unfortunately unable to <laughs> at this point. Okay, well I'm predicting it's it's going to be like if you have your own crowdfunding campaign it might be like displayed in the store it might be some kind of live funding element there which I think would be so neat. Like that that's really cool if if that's the case. It's um, going to be very exciting, I can tell you that and it will redefine the landscape of how um crowdfunding works. Yeah, totally. Uh, so if your focus is on the post crowdfunding phase and kind of helping people grow their brands and such, you know, you obviously help from like a distribution element where like you're giving people another place where they can sell their product. Do you guys do anything else in terms of helping those people post campaign? Okay. So let, let me explain this. Uh, it's quite cool. So we're the only store in the world to be able to take a brand right from ground up like, Hey, okay. 
I have an idea. So we can teach them how to launch a campaign, how to how to do product design, how to basically all the resources we have. We'll teach them how to do it. We'll push them along the way. And then they launch the campaign. We'll help them. We'll help them to monitor that campaign. Um, eventually, going to sell. Here's the fun part. If you're in a WTP store, or rather, if a brand comes on board WTP store, they have instant turnkey access to all the other markets that we're in. So within one week, you your your brand could be selling in Singapore, Malaysia, US, and every other place that we have a WTP store, which is almost unheard of for any anyone else. It's very difficult to get uh, cross borders across to another country as a growing brand, mm-hmm. and we offer that kind get that kind of thing. Next up, um, I think this is something that brands could be very interested in. We also tie up uh, with different distributors because right now we're a retailer, correct? We don't distribute. We just retail. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a lot of ties to different distributors. So what that means is we can recommend or rather make recommendations to our distributor network and say, hey, guys, this is a, this is a brand that you might look at. This is a brand that you might want to take a distributorship in. So if they like it, they will buy at bulk and form an agreement with the brand and they will be distributing within a different country, et cetera, et cetera. That means instant cash flow. Mm, I see. Yeah. I see. Awesome. Uh, when it comes to also, you mentioned helping crowdfunding campaigns. Like, Are you kind of like an, an agency in that way? Like you'll help them put together their video and, and the different manufacturing and designing the page and such? That's right. So right now that portion is being developed. Uh, it's still in the beta phase so far. So I can't really talk so much about that right now because there are a lot of new new things that I would love to tell you tell you closer to the data, FCBC. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. So much secret secrecy around this, man. <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. I mean, in time, in time. Uh, this, I think it's it's a really important um, component because all too often, you know, you'll have people who do a successful crowdfunding campaign. They get a bunch of hype. They get a bunch of funding in the door, and then it's like, what do we do with that? Like, we have this media attention. We have all this credibility. We have customers now. I guess we could launch another crowdfunding campaign, but it's how do you actually level up the business? You know, how do you go from being a small team of maybe four or five people and really grow that into something larger? I think that's the, the big question on a lot of e-commerce entrepreneurs' minds. How do you actually scale? You know what I'm saying? And how do you do it in a way that doesn't sort of break your cash flow and, and break the um, systems that you have in place? You know what I mean? I totally understand what you mean. Well, I guess it really depends on what type of product they can offer uh, and how they could extend that product line into different markets and different applications and hit different age groups, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's all about having that plan from the get-go, but not everyone can see that once mm-hmm. they, uh, only until they start. So at the end of the day, the most important thing is to start. <laughs> Totally, totally. Um, yeah. so, so I want to get into um, this event that you're hosting in or that you're putting on in New York City. But before we do that, I'd love sure. if we could dive into some of your experience here. Do you have any advice or tips that you can impart to the crowdfunders right now that are listening on the podcast? You know, you've done a, a campaigns before. You're very familiar with this space. Do you have any lessons that you can impart on that front? Sure. Okay. So this is my favorite. I gotta introduce you to a killer resource, The Gadget Flow. Their website reaches more than 28 million people per month. Brands like DJI, HP, and Pioneer have used them to increase awareness and boost sales along with more than 4,000 crowdfunding campaigns. They have a new unboxing series on YouTube where you can get your product unboxed by a tech expert. Lastly, you can get feedback for your crowdfunding campaign and increase conversions by using Crowd Insight. You can check them out at thegadgetflow.com. I know Kickstarter or Indiegogo does suggest having a campaign length of 30 days. I mean, that's the suggested time. But I found that 45 days has seems to be the best one for us. Uh, all my campaigns are 45 days, at least 40 to 45 days long. Why? So here's the thing. In 45 days, you would definitely capture two payment cycles. When I say two, two payment cycles, that means that your backers would have gotten their paychecks twice. Mm, interesting. Right? And that's something very interesting to think about because that means you have a double or rather a second chance at them funding you. Mm. Right. And you can always remarket that fact to them. Uh in, in your communications, you can tell them, hey guys, um please uh refer your friends to the campaign or send or you can send out another EDM or you can do another um uh, campaign ad 
targeted at a new crowd for that month. That's interesting. So basically thinking yeah. backwards, like um, what is the experience of the backers? You know, they obviously, even if they want your project, maybe they just didn't get paid. So they, can't, right. they can't get it, but they can get it that's right. after the next cycle. It doesn't is isn't that very logical? Yeah, that's a really sneaky trick. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. It's really true. People get paid and then they want to spend. Yeah, but that's if you so do true. thirty days, high chance it's only one payment cycle. Okay, so maybe consider um, lengthening the duration of your campaign. What's another lesson that you've learned from doing these different projects? Okay, so then my tip number two in your this is for your reward planning for all my campaigns, right? All the campaigns that we've done. The first early bird tier, I'll always, I will always limit it to um, an amount where it's exclusive. Okay, so what, what I mean is, let's say my campaign goal is 10 grand, for example. I'll make sure that my early bird tier one has limited amount of, sp- a long, a long amount of space that if it's filled up, it will hit 10 grand at least. Mm, okay. So making that sure it, it fills up quickly. That's right. So make sure that I get funded. And it makes sure that most of the time all my marketing efforts will ensure that we get funded in the first day, 24 hours. I think that kind of so, begs the question of like, how do you decide that? Like, how do you gauge demand and decide how to limit that? Right. <laughs> That's also a good question. I'll, I'll usually look at um, our pre-existing data. That means like, the past campaigns I've done, how many people have um, backed the first tier mm-hmm. and at what price points. And if we don't, if, for example, if you are a crowdfunder that doesn't have any previous uh, crowdfunding experience, which is which is a lot, so you could look at other campaigns that are in the si- in a similar type of industry as you are and see what kind of, how many backers they got in the first day. Okay, okay. So kind of do a doing a little bit of competitor research there. Yeah, you have to do that. The most important thing is to look at your market, look at your landscape. Who has, who has launched something very similar to what you've done? What kind of numbers did they reach? What, what is the market cap on that? You know, and as, then from there, you've got to look. As a follow-up question, I had, I had one more that lesson I'd love you can impart, but I had a follow-up question to that where, okay, so let's just say that we do that. Um, that's really going to eat into the margins. Like if the reward is the standard reward is already off the retail price. Are you almost mm-hmm. just, is your idea or strategy not to make very much with the early bird reward tiers and just like kind of have those be the social proof of the campaign? Yes, that is true. Because at the end of the day, put it this way, you're going to spend on marketing anyway. So this is just a different way of spending on it. Okay. And I never thought about it that way. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I, I mean, this is, I mean, these are two awesome tips. I'd love you could share like maybe one more um, that you've come across either as a lesson learned, could be from a failure or something. Um, it would be great if you could share that with the audience. Let me see, one more. I would say, okay, um, <clears throat> I, we made this mistake in our second campaign. Um, so second campaign was the Natsu Wallet. All you listeners, please do not do this. <laughs> <laughs> Basically... We had um, the Natsu wallet. We had a choice of 17 different colors, 1-7, which is a lot. And we had also a choice in RFID protected or non-RFID protected. Also, we also had a choice in initial debossing or no initial debossing. So if you do the, uh, the math, that means 17 times 17 times 17. All those options. Yeah. All those options. And that would mean shipping was hell. A nightmare. <laughs> a nightmare. And, and because we didn't uh, get a fulfillment agency to do it, and we did it ourselves to save cost, uh, wow, it was crazy. Don't ever do that. Try to limit, limit your SKUs to you know, maximum of like five to six. Um, don't, don't go too crazy because it does seem like, I know it would seem like, it's cool and you want to offer that kind of thing to your backers, but in actuality, it's going to kill you. What, why is it that you, you did offer that to your backers? Is it because you, you had a lot of questions or like people wanted different versions of it? You just thought it'd be a good idea? Well, it was more of a... We just wanted to give as much, as, as, as much options as we could because there was a lot of materials that we could offer and we just wanted to see which ones did better, which colors did better because that would allow us to narrow down later on which colors were successful so we can just 
laser focus on those and kill out the rest. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but still too scary. <laughs> I think it's a really important lesson too, because it's it's sort of like business is one of those things where it's a it's a healthy partnership between two people. It's the people that you're you know you're spending your time creating a product for other people. If you break your back and you have low profit margins and you have too many SKUs and it's impossible to ship this thing, it might the promises might sound incredible. People are like, that sounds great, like this is an incredible campaign. But if you're not able then to fulfill that and fulfill on those promises, it hurts your brand. So exactly. it's kind of like a balance between offering something that's high quality, that's great, that has good promises, but also being able to earn a profit, being able to reinvest in the company, and also being able to deliver on those promises. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, that's right. I, yeah, I think it's kind of a balance there. Uh, those, those are some awesome tips, man. I also think that when it comes to doing these different campaigns, you're always learning with every single one that you're launching. You're always learning from your previous mistakes. You're always learning from the things that work and don't work. And also Kickstarter changes over time. So there's also that learning aspect. That's right. So right now, Kickstarter, the landscape of Kickstarter has changed a little bit more. Um, I think now they're more focused on the arts. As you can see on the first, if you once you go to their campaign page or rather Kickstarter.com, the first few things you would see is more like artistic campaigns instead of products. So it has shifted a little bit. Yeah, I think... Also, I mean, with Indiegogo, um, we're seeing a lot more pl- uh, projects just go on Indiegogo after Kickstarter, seeing a lot more hardware and technology types of projects going on Indiegogo. Um, it's kind of interesting the way the platforms have sort of segmented themselves, though. I mean, obviously, Kickstarter still has like a massive audience um, compared to That's right. the other ones. So this kind of brings me to, in my, my role with within the community, I've always wanted to put out good quality education because I think that's kind of what is lacking. I mean, that's the whole goal behind starting my podcast. Um, that was the whole goal between behind the books that I've written. I think that education literally can make the difference between a successful campaign and a not successful campaign. I think if you're at any time able to get in-person kind of training or being able to learn from other people, like it is paramount. So that kind of brings me to this new event that you're putting on in New York City. And I've actually haven't seen too many people do like live events related to crowdfunding. Can you tell us a little bit about that? All right. So... The event is called For Creators by Creators. Um, we'll be doing our biggest one so far in New York. So this was this was conceived because the same the same thing as what you are doing. We wanted to provide a platform. We wanted to give people the knowledge, the in depth knowledge from industry leaders, um, to know how to launch a successful crowdfunding campaign or what happens after that. Because these things, I mean, it's that kind of information is difficult to find. Uh, there are not many people like you or I around to to give proper good information, and that's that's what we try, we're trying to do because we we discovered the wonders and magic of crowdfunding and how it's enabled so many people. It's provided so many jobs and so many opportunities with various different people all around the world. And the thing about crowdfunding is that it doesn't look at your certification. You don't have to have like a PhD or something like that. You just need to have good idea mm-hmm. and a good mindset that's all those are the prerequisites so what's so, going to happen at the at the event all right so we'll have a couple of different panel sessions uh talking about various different things like how to launch a campaign um or what happens after you launch how do you how do you go international or how do you even think about protect, protecting your intellectual property things like that uh, it's very, very key discussions, and it will be held in a very, um, how do I explain this, like intimate setting, mm-hmm. where where your the information that you get will be crucial. It will not be a very big event where you stand far away from an audience. No, it will be up close and personal where you get to mingle, talk, and understand, understand how the workings of actually doing the work. Mm-hmm. Is this your first event, or have you guys done other ones no, before? No, we've done quite a few already. Uh, I think we started our first one in Babson, Boston. Oh, nice! That was yeah, that was a while ago, and that was great. Um, Babson was so so great to uh, give us a space to use. Um, <clears throat> so that was the first one. Then we did our second one in St. Louis when we launched our store, mm-hmm. and then we did a smaller one in Las Vegas for CES. Cool, cool. Yeah, How many people are you? How many people are you expecting for this upcoming event? For this one, I think we're doing like 500 people. Wow, that's awesome. That's a lot, man. Well, congratulations. We want more, of course, but (laughs) we wanted the most important thing was it to be intimate. 
Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I find a lot of the times um, when I was younger, I didn't really like conferences. Like, I thought they were kind of boring, honestly. Um, That's right. You know, you just kind of like <laughs> talk with people. You're super fake. You hand out business That's cards. Right. It's really boring. But I, I like... Best. I like the take that you have on this event. So number one, it doesn't seem like it's just networking. Like obviously there is, you can meet other um, business owners, people that are starting projects, people that have already run campaigns. You can learn from your peers there. But um, what I also liked was there's live funding that you're having during the event. That seems really That's cool right. to me. Um, I saw you're going to have a bunch of creators that have the opportunity to actually do a pitch in front of the crowd and get That's advice right. and critiques. Um, so it seems like it's a little bit more than just like a boring kind of networking thing. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. so that's what kind of drew me to the event there. And also I think the fact that you can showcase your products, um, you can learn more about the post campaign process. You can also learn about, um, the actual fundraising process. It seems like it's kind of like an all in one kind of event there. That's right. So, I mean, we're trying to build that community and, Whilst we also want to show people that we the people isn't just retail, we're actually a platform. Retail is just one of the things we do. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> on the surface, we may look like a retail store, but if you look deeper, we're actually a community and a platform that enables people. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so if you're in the New York City area, um, if you're in New Jersey, if you're even you know, an hour away or two hours away, I totally think this is a, a must attend. Um, number one, you're going to get through a lot of killer education, um, a lot of things in the way of step by step, what do you have to do to grow your brand? What do you have to do to protect your intellectual property, the nuts and bolts behind working through a manufacturer, transitioning from crowdfunding to launching to building a business like this is this is everything that you need in order for the next five years to put you on a good roadmap i think to success in addition you know there's some awesome speakers here um, actually one of the speakers we had on the podcast uh previously like way back when if you guys go back into uh episode number 29 we had on the founder of solar puff uh, Alice. And um, she talked about how she raised over $300,000 on Kickstarter for her project. She's going to be one of the presenters here at this at this panel. And um, I'm going to do some moderating also at the panel, try to get you guys some really great inside tips and secrets and advice when it comes to growing your brand, um, launching a campaign, and also going from there. So I'm excited. And I think it's going to be an awesome event. And um, I also think what you guys are doing is so sorely needed in the industry. You know, we really need people out there that are getting products into the hands of people and sh allowing them to see what actually a crowdfunded product is like. And it, it, it really competes and I think is better with than um, some of the other traditional products. You might just find like a, a, a low quality product on Amazon. So I really like what it is you guys are doing. Thank you. I mean, we try our best. We just want to build brands here. The, we the people is not so much of a retail store we yes we do sell products but we want to make sure that the brand stories are told and people know the ideas and inspirations behind every product how they came to be who made this why all the whys the hows the what's everything so all our staff knows every single product inside outside and the people behind them so that's the experience when you come into a store like like ours you will learn things it's more of an educational things ed educational tour Mm. Um, the other thing I would add there is like, I think my biggest fear is that crowdfunding would become commercial and you would get people coming in here with like suits and ties, like finance Wall Street people trying to just use your, you for your business or use you for the product that you've created. Whereas this is created by other creators. You know, it's really, I think, in line with sort of the ethos of Kickstarter or Indiegogo, where this this um, type of educational setting and also the stuff that you guys are doing, it's creators by creators, you know, for creators, which is kind of cool. Um, so I also like that that element of what you guys are doing. But um, if you're interested in checking out this event, if you're in New York City, like I said, or in the area, um, you also you can say hi to me if you're at the event. You can go to crowdcrux.com slash FCBC, um, I believe it is. Let me double check there. Crowdcrux.com slash FCBC, for creators by creators. So you go to that link. I'll also include that at the end of the show. And you guys can um, check out this event. You can look a bit more into the things you're going to learn and discover. Also, some of the other industry experts that are going to be there. And I think this is like a mega opportunity for meeting some really high quality people um, and also learning a ton about the process of growing a brand. 
Man, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Um, Ryan, I really appreciate your time sharing some of your advice and tips. It's been awesome, and I look forward to, to watching the growth of uh, We The People. Thank you. It was a really an honor to be on your show, man. I'm so happy to be here. Let me tell you about our latest sponsor, SendPro Online by Pitney Bowes. Shipping can be complex. Things can get really confusing really fast. With SendPro Online, it's easy to save time and money no matter what you send, from letters and packages to overnights and flats. You can easily compare USPS, UPS, and FedEx in an all-in-one online tool. You can print shipping labels and stamps directly from your printer. You can even track all of your shipments and get email notifications when they've arrived. SendPro Online is only $14.99 a month and Listeners can get a free 30-day trial when you visit pb.com slash crowdcrux. That's pb.com slash crowdcrux. Experience the convenience of SendPro Online for yourself when you sign up for a free 30-day trial. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Man, that was a lot of great information, a lot of great advice. And also, I am so excited and stoked for this event. I think it's going to be killer. It's going to be a ton of fun. And also, I think it's just... It's it's great to hear directly from people that are there and doing it, like in the trenches, people that have successfully grown businesses, people that have successfully launched campaigns on Kickstarter and Indigo and are raising money. And they're telling you exactly how they did it, what worked, what didn't. It's kind of like getting access to almost like a secret world, if you will, because um, a lot of people aren't very talkative about what led to their success, what's actually working now when it comes to e-commerce, to growing a brand. This is kind of like, I think, a great event if you've been putting off launching a campaign or you've already launched a campaign and you're like, okay, I don't need to scale this one up. Like I need to start my business and really grow this thing more. You know, I've done already a campaign, but like I want to level this up. Um, I think this is a great starting point in that roadmap. And it gives you that roadmap, the kind of blueprint, if you will, in terms of how do you do manufacturing? How do you connect with um, quality providers? How do you figure out the IP element of your business? What about equity crowdfunding? What about all these other things? And also how do you grow, go for from having just one campaign to then growing a band, uh, a brand and having global expansion with your reach. This is so, it's so I think crucial and important for every entrepreneur out there. If you want to check out the, the link to uh, learn about some of the speakers that are happening at this event and learn a bit more about that, you can go to crowdcrux.com slash FCBC. That is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X dot com slash FCBC, crowdcrux.com slash FCBC. You can learn more about the event there. Hope you love it. If you do show up, um, make sure to introduce yourself so I can say hi. And um, I'll, without further ado, I think this has been a great episode. Look forward to our one next week. Thank you so much for your time and for listening. And I will see you next time.